Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at QuickSurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. You can subscribe to an Og Vorbis feed, an MP3 feed, and a video feed uh, right there in the show notes for each and every episode. You can also find us online over at YouTube, uh, blip.tv, Daily Motion, uh, TuneIn, Stitcher Radio, and there's a few other places I don't remember off the top of my head, but I published two uh, as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, this is episode one of season six of the Geekinator. So uh, this is uh, kind of exciting. The first uh, episode and the next 42 episodes will be, uh, including this episode, will be uh, part of season six. So let's go ahead and get right into the cool stuff that I found for this episode. Over at makezine.com, they have a... Uh, really awesome post it's called the 10 most popular make videos of all time so they are just shy of hitting 500,000 subscribers on their youtube channel makesign.com and um, so they are celebrating that by posting the 10 videos that they published to to their youtube channel top 10 of all time uh, pretty awesome that I'm a huge fan of make and I watch, I've seen just about every one of these videos. There's a couple of them, uh, particularly the earlier ones that I haven't seen cause I didn't discover their YouTube channel till a, a while back, but there's, they're pretty awesome. Definitely check this out. Pretty neat. From uh, the New York Times in their personal tech section uh, or in their GadgetWise blog, there's a post here, a digital camera from a kit. Learning toys often start as a collection of parts, which after the assembly and presumably the learning collect dust on a shelf. But the Big Shot camera is an educational kit that once built is a usable digital camera with its own battery charging crank, 3D lens and wide angle and regular lenses and online lessons about optics, electronics, and imaging. The camera says it is intended for children eight and up, although it takes a lot of patience and careful attention to instructions to build the camera. So the author here, uh, Roy Fergot, Fergot, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. Uh, it took him about an hour to complete the project. This looks pretty cool. I could totally see... Uh, doing something like this, maybe not for an eight year old, but definitely, uh, somebody, you know, one, if you have a kid who's into photography and also kind of into the whole do it yourself thing, definitely worth checking out for sure. Over at Gizmodo, there's a post, the Iris quadcopter is a drone for tinkerers short on time. That's right. If you're into tweaking and fiddling with your gadgets, but don't have the time to start a big project from scratch, the new Iris drone iris drone from 3d robotics could be right up your street while 3d robotics the company run by x wired editor chris anderson tends to concentrate on the maker community it's now decided to sell a pre-built drone too it'll fly out of the box controlled by an android device ios's control is coming soon and even managing single button takeoff and landing so the drone itself packs an ARM Cortex M4 processor. It's got a built-in data radio, so it lets you follow the flights in real time. You can also get a GoPro that'll, you know, it costs extra to do the GoPro, but you can get a GoPro on there as well. So pretty neat. Definitely check it out. From Uber Gizmo, Uber Gizmo. Lego Mindstorms EV3 Unveiled is the title of this post. Now, we've been talking a little bit, a little bit about the new Mindstorms EV3 over the past few weeks, and uh, this is pretty neat. Lego continues to deliver when it comes to their Mindstorms kit, and the latest one is known as the Lego Mindstorms EV3, which will include construction materials such as studs, beams, girders, and wheels, which will then be used to construct a robot. 
Just when you thought that Lego was all about bricks, don't be surprised to find out that the only brick which you'll be able to discover here would be the robot's very own programmable brain. Pretty awesome. The EV3 will hit markets later this September 1st at most major retailers will retail where it will retail for $350 a pop. So not cheap, but still pretty neat. I'm actually considering picking one of these up because I have a Lego fanatic in my house and this would be awfully cool to have around. From uh, CoolestGadgets.com, building block aircraft carrier. This is kind of neat in this day and age, despite the massive advancements made in warfare. Having an aircraft carrier as part of your military power is still a crucial element. So there's a $299.95 building block aircraft carrier. They've got a picture of it here on the website. Pretty neat. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes. So you can find those online over at quicksurf.com. Uh, it looks pretty sizable. It's definitely not a small kit, considering the fact that it's 300 bucks. So uh, this is definitely uh, not for you know a four or five year old for sure. From Mashable, eleven top if this then that recipes to activate now. So how many of you have heard of IFTTT? If this then that. Well, if you have. There's a whole lot of cool stuff you can do with it. And this has some of the 11 top IF, IFTTT recipes. But that's really hard to say. If you don't know about If This Then That or IFTTT, definitely go check it out. It's really awesome. One of the coolest things ever on the internet. That's all I'm going to say. So uh, from Ars Technica... In their technology lab slash information technology section, there's a post here. How easy is it to hack JavaScript in a browser? So it's a it's a Q and A. Um, it's from uh, Stack Exchange, and uh, the user is asking about JavaScript security. My take on it is JavaScript is not secure. You, it's code running in the browser. It's not secure. Anytime you have code running in the client, it's not going to be secure. In fact, I'm going to totally age myself here and be really super old school and say, in general, JavaScript is a bad idea. The reason why I say this is for exactly this reason. Uh, you know, does JavaScript have some benefit? Absolutely. There are some things you can do in JavaScript to make the user experience a little more fluid, but doing form validation, doing any kind of security, doing anything other than basic UI streamlining, I'll call, uh, JavaScript is not a good idea. And even then I use JavaScript very, very, very sparingly. The only time I use JavaScript, like I said, is when uh, for my own web stuff, is when I'm just trying to make the user interaction a little more fluid and and when i don't want to require a round trip to the server for something you know there are some things like for example you're inputting a phone number and you know you're in the united states um it might not be such a bad idea to, to just have a little javascript validation to kind of help enforce the format that they're entering it in there on the browser uh you know, you still have to you still have to do all your form validation. You know, it's not really form validation; it's prompting the user. You know, like let's say they it's you know you're expecting a ten digit number, and if they put like you know four eight five dot three four three dot you know I don't know one 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 or five 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 five, and you're like uh, no no dots, make it a dash, or maybe you have a little bit of uh, JavaScript foo in there to detect that that's ten digits minus you know the dots or the dashes or whatever they want to use uh for a delimiter between phone numbers that's fine um other examples uh like uh you know one of my pet peeves is you know websites that have like a ton of javascript right and you enter your zip code and they still make you enter your state and country and it's like well you already know my state and country based on the zip code I just entered. 
why aren't you auto filling that out as soon as I you make me you know a lot of them they make you fill in your zip code first but then they make you then fill in all the rest of your stuff and it's like well hang on just based on my zip code alone you know what city and state I live in city state and country I live in so really you should ask me for my street address and my zip code and figure the rest out <laughs> you know I mean it's stuff like that that I, I, you know, I, I find that, you know, but they have a bunch of JavaScript to do form validation and like all this other stuff. And it's like, do you have any idea how easy it is to get around that? That's what this article is talking about. It's incredibly easy. Anytime you have code running in a client, like a web browser, it is incredibly easy to get around. You better be, if you know you're, what you're doing, you better be doing your form validation on the server. And if you're going to go through all the effort of doing your form validation on the server, why are you doubling it up on the browser? It's a waste of time and effort. Regardless, uh, so check this out. If you do a lot of web development, you know my position is JavaScript in general you should use sparingly. Uh, there are situations uh, where it can actually make for a really great user experience. You know, Google Maps is a great example of JavaScript in action. A lot of a lot of Google Web stuff is a great example of JavaScript in action. Um, it really helps the user experience, but outside of that, I, I tend to use JavaScript exceedingly sparingly simply because more often than not, you really do want to do a lot of the, what you're doing in JavaScript on the server where you control the code and it's a lot more difficult to circumvent things. So anyway, uh, that's it for this episode of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And with that, I will talk with all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.